shout to God with the songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued people under us and nation under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Hallelujah. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. He is highly exalted. He is highly exalted. Can you go ahead and praise the highly exalted King of all kings this morning? Hallelujah. As we come, let's worship the name of the Lord. As we sing praises to him this morning, we invite you to just lift your hands and get lost in his praises. The praise belong to him this morning. Let's give him the praise that he deserves. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. One more time. Hallelujah. Let's just give our hands and just worship him. Let's lift our hands and worship him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We worship your holy name. See, we adore you. We kneel down before you. We worship your holy name. Ah, 
sing and worship the name of the Lord our God this morning. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and they are saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're glad this morning that we can run to the potter. He has, hold us in his, he has held us in his hands this morning. And we are so grateful for his love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Days are all of my days are held in your hand, crafted into, crafted into your perfect plan, your perfect plan. Let's sing, beautiful Lord, beautiful Lord.
today. Call me Lord. Guide me. Lead me Jesus and walk beside me. Hallelujah.
Let's just lift our hands and worship. Let's just lift our hands and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we just lift our hands and just stand in awe of the presence of Jehovah? In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Hallelujah. 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 Is there a hallelujah in the house? 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 Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? And how did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? Why did I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You do miracles. You are more than they. More than able, you are, you are, you are more than able. You are.
We're going to be praying before we pray I want to read in your hearing from 1st Corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 to 26 this is not our Bible reading well, it is a Bible reading, but not the Bible reading. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any lesser part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any lesser part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, 
the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Um, earlier Paul had said, so it is with Christ. So what Paul, everything Paul is saying here about the human body, so it is with Christ. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So it is in the church. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You see why we need the church, brethren? Almost every single one of the imperatives in the New Testament, in the letters, are plural. Where Paul says, I want you to do this. Almost every single one of them are plural. He knows we cannot do them together. We cannot do what he says by ourselves. We have to do them as a body. And to, to withdraw from the body is always dangerous. This morning, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for some special people. And I'm going to call some names, and I think maybe only one person knows that I'm going to call their name, but I'm going to call the names of some persons. And I, I want them to come and stand out front here, and we're going to be praying for them and for others, and for others. So I want to call for Albert Coburn, Michael Thompson, Marjorie Carter, Doreen Davidson, Verrall Duar. I want to ask you to come, please. I know that you're here, and I want to call Sister Coke to come, the mother of Dejanay McIntyre. I know we don't normally do this, but we're doing this this morning. So, so these precious brothers and sister, sisters are battling with afflictions, not just normal afflictions, but very serious afflictions. Come here, Lady Coke. Sister Coke is the mother of Dejane. She's been in the intensive care unit now for a couple of weeks, just having several seizures, one after the other. The doctors don't really know what to do. And um, I guess the majority of us would not have known that. And um, it's not easy to put the spotlight on people. Some of us don't like that. But you know, brethren, the truth is in our human body, if my hand is hurting me, I can't keep my foot from knowing. If my eye is hurting me, my big toe is going to know about it. Have you ever had a toothache yet? 
the whole body knows about it. And I understand that many times we want to deal with our grief and our pain privately. I understand that a hundred percent. But I also know that God has constituted the human body in such a way that it can heal itself. And if that is true of the physical body, it must be true of the spiritual body. And so without any fanfare, and, and I'm, I'm just going to ask if there's anybody else whose name I have not called, but you are battling with a very serious illness, a very serious illness, and the doctors don't know what to do, I want to ask you to come to whatever it is. Please. I... I see Sister Donna Walters right here in green. Sometimes I hear us talking about how well our health services are doing. And there are people standing here who critically need um, MRI machines and dialysis machines just to go on living and sometimes for weeks there is no service anywhere and where there is service it is so expensive um, so, so, so these precious brethren are here. And, and I'd like, first of all, I'd like to ask our elders to come, those who are here, and I want you to just stand beside one of these persons. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to invite members of the body of Christ to maybe understand even a little bit of what I just read, if you would come and just be in a position where you can feel, feel and empathize. We want to pray for the Neil family. Brother Dwight Neil is critically ill. He's overseas, very, very ill. His, uh, his mother and some other relatives have been giving care to him up there. I want us to pray for them. You know his wife, Sister Connie, his sons, Josiah and Joseph. They are here with us really needing our prayers as well and our support. And um, they're not here today, but we want to remember them in prayer. So if, if you could just look to Jesus, if we could all do that. And um, sometimes, brethren, sometimes, sometimes the situation doesn't change. But God helps us with our perspective and I, I, I'd really be happy if, if somebody close to you who is here, if, if we could get maybe a piece of paper, some writing implement, and take the name and the phone number and just make contact, maybe once a week. Just say, you know... I don't know exactly what's happening, and you don't have to tell me, give me any details, but I just want you to know I'm here for you. Sophia Ann is here up front who spoke to us on several Sundays about the potter. 
She's also very ill, but she's here today. And we had a precious young lady who helped us with our music uh, last week. She came, she worshipped with us when the stock exchange group came. I think she was a, a part of that group. She played with their singers and just... Um, just asked if she could come here and help us and to play after that service. And she was bitten by a dog. And so, so she's not here today. So we just want to pray for each other. Those who are in the congregation, would you stand with us, please, as, as we pray. Let's all talk to the Lord. Our God and our Father, we stand here today not in positions of power, not in positions of might. We stand here today in positions of weakness, in positions of frailty, in positions of need. We're not here, Lord, to demand anything of you. We are here to seek your face and to cry out to you for help, for mercy, for grace. We are feeble folk, insufficient, broken. We're not very much to speak about, Lord. But we have a God, and we sang about our God earlier, a God of miracles. And we are captured by your holy calling. And so here we are. We are here because you ordained us to be here today. And we have gathered together, Lord, to worship you, even in a feeble way. We are here to worship you. Now, Lord, we ask you to, to be with us, to visit with us, to condescend, to come down in our midst and to minister to us. Lord, we want to pray especially today for some precious people, some of whom are standing here, some overseas, needing your miraculous intervention. Lord God, some of them for their very lives to be saved, their physical lives. We pray, Lord, that in your grace, you will minister to them in a very special way, a very special way. Heal them, Lord. We believe that you are the healer. Minister to their bodies. Oh God, it's never over until you say it's over. Because you are God. You are sovereign. You are the great God of the universe. And we are your people. And you care for us. Remember those battling in the hospital, in hospices, at home, but still fighting. Oh God, we pray that your power will be manifested here today in the lives of your people. We thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ. Thank you for bringing us together as a family. None of us is sufficient of ourselves, Lord. Our sufficiency is of you. So, Lord, as we come together as a body, just wanting to stand with each other and help each other and bear one another's burdens, we ask you, Lord, to be with us. Help the body 
to understand the power of the body. Lord God, this service is dedicated to you. Take it and fashion it as you desire. And let your name be glorified. Minister to your body today in every way, Lord, as we sing, as we read your word, as we receive offerings, as we listen to the ministry of the word. In every area of our worship today, Lord, may your name be glorified. And may we leave here transformed, Lord. In your mercy, we ask these blessings and in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks now, Lord, because we know that you have heard our prayer. And if we pray anything according to your will, you hear us. And if you hear us, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. Let's just slip our hands up and let's, let's just worship the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful to be in a family. No perfect person here at all. Nobody who has made it already. Just all of us really in the same boat. All, all of us really in the same boat. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much. I, I want you to, to do after the service today to just come to some of these precious people and take their names and and, and let's let's keep in touch with them. It's it's something that we all have to do. Praise God, praise God, praise God. The word of the Lord. Ezekiel 14, verses 1 to 11. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man. These men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. And I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people. 
and you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand against him and will destroy him from in the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear their punishment, the punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirer shall be alike. That the house of Israel may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, declares the Lord God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Bless Jesus. Kindly asking all children ages 6 to 16, you may go over to Sunday school at this time. Just reach for the person next to you, and if they don't mind, just hold their hands. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. Where no problem can defeat us, we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. Can we do it one more time and look the person in the eye? You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There no problem can defeat us. Do you believe it? Walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand as long as there is love we will stand praise the lord my duty today is to bring you welcome we're so happy that you decided to worship with us today at the grace workshop ministries Today we have worshiping with us, Mrs. Marie Allen. Can you stand if you're here? Visiting from New York, and she's the guest of Sister Dorian Hilton. Give her a round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us, Mrs. Allen. And if there are any other first-time or second-time visitors, we're so happy that you are with us today. And for those viewing us online, if it's your first time, just want to let you know you are viewing the Grace Workshop Ministries, the place where grace happens. Do continue to view us online. Thank you. Now, one more time, look at somebody, one more person, and I want you to look them in the eye. You're going to repeat after me, and whatever it is that you say to them, I want you to say it with confidence. Are you ready? You are blessed. You are peculiar. You are chosen. And most of all, you are loved by God. Do enjoy the rest of today's service. Please listen carefully. A point to ponder. Jesus throughout scripture by Alistair Begg. The scripture reading is taken from Acts 8, 34 to 35. 
And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told the good news about Jesus. As we journey throughout the Bible, we recognize that Jesus did not arrive out of nowhere. From start to finish, the Bible is a book about him. Indeed, even the Old Testament prophets, under the inspiration of the Spirit, wrote about Jesus. If we take our eyes off Christ, then, however well we know Scripture, we will have missed its center, its key, and its hero. In the Gospels, Jesus pointed people to the Old Testament to help them understand who he was. Early in his ministry, he was once at the synagogue reading from the, the scroll of Isaiah, As he finished, Luke tells us he began to say to his listeners, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Later, speaking to people who were especially interested and versed in the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus warned them, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. This is taken from John 5, verse 39. After his death and resurrection, when he encountered some of his dejected disciples on the road to Eumaeus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, I'm sorry, Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, Jesus clearly taught that every part of the Old Testament finds its focus and fulfillment in him. When you and I read the scriptures, we meet Jesus because this book testifies to him. Even if our studies and understanding of the Old Testament passage provides us with good, important ethical truths about life, there's great danger of us missing the truth, which is Jesus. The purpose of every page of your Bible is for you to meet Jesus, to come to know him and to proclaim his great name all for his glory. In every sermon you and I hear, in every lesson you and I study, and every passage of God's word you and I read, we must ask ourselves, did it bring me to Christ? Did I discover Jesus in it? And do not stop listening, studying, and reading until you can answer yes. For it is in him that the treasures of salvation, truth, wisdom, and comfort are found. Questions for you to think about. How is God calling me to think differently? How is God reordering my heart's affections? Specifically what about what I love? What is God calling me to do as I go about my day-to-day life. Think about these things. Everything that we do, everything that we say, it must be God-centered. Remember that. And he's helping us all. We are not perfect, but he's definitely helping us all to get there. Bless you.
The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters, comes to us today from the eighth chapter of John's record of the life of Jesus. Verses 31 to 36. Some of you may know that John's Gospel, unlike Mark and Matthew and Luke, concentrates really on the week. On the week, the last week of Jesus' life. Most of the Gospel has to do with the last few weeks of his life. So, John does not attempt to give us a truly biographical sketch. John is, John is preaching. He's preaching. And he, he tells us that why he's writing is, he, he says, evangelism is on my mind. He says, I could, write, I could have written many things about Jesus, but th what I have written is to help you to believe and in believing to have life through his name. In verses 31 to 36, we read, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Lord God, we ask for your help. We ask for your help. We ask for your help. We ask for your help in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 32 of our text, the Lord Jesus informs the Jews who had made a profession of faith in him that if they are truly his disciples, not only will they abide or continue continue in his word, but they will also know the truth, and that truth will set them free. Their response to his statement is our first indication that something about their profession of faith is not genuine. Their response was, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? They don't listen to Jesus' word. He is telling them something about them. And they are rebutting what he's saying without even considering the implications. Hearts that are truly converted ponder. They don't rebut the words of their master. They ponder and say, I don't understand what he is saying. Let me think about this. Let me ask the Holy Spirit to help me. There are things that Jesus says to us 
that it is very difficult for us to appreciate. There are ways that God operates that are difficult for us to appreciate. But like I have been saying to us, our faith is not in a what, but in a whom. Their reaction, as I have said, involve both an assertion and a denial. Their assertion was that they were the offspring or descendants of Abraham. And being his physical de descendants made them believe that they would automatically inherit the kingdom of God. I am Abraham's offspring. I've never been a slave. Their denial was, was just that. They had never been slaves to anyone. And throughout their history, they had continually been subjected to bondage. They were slaves in Egypt. The Canaanites. The whole book of Judges is all about that. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians. And, and at that very moment, they were subjects of Rome. So this is a remarkable statement. And, and even, if, even if they had thought, even if they misunderstood Jesus, maybe they thought they didn't understand he was speaking about slavery to sin. But even their political history belied what they were saying, which tells me how blindness can overtake a people or an individual. They are not even able to recognize their own condition. In verse 34, our Lord provides a commentary on the meaning of spiritual slavery and spiritual liberty. He makes a statement of incontrovertible truth. Truly, truly, or as the King James Version has it, verily, verily, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So he's informing these Jews who profess to believe in him that if a person's lifestyle, if their lifestyle is characterized by sin, then he or she is a slave to sin. And I have been stressing the point that he's not here speaking of an act of sin or of occasional lapses into sin. He's speaking here of a lifestyle of habitual sin. He warns the Jews that they were still in bondage because of their sins. And this bondage was not one that they could liberate themselves from. It is only the Son who could set them free from this bondage. And, 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 and so, brothers and sisters, I, if you know me, I, 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 I am I'm very attracted to persons who have fought for freedom, any kind of freedom. I am attracted to those persons. And I, and, I, and I know that their contribution has been significant. But often at the end of the day, when I think about them, when I read about them, when I watch documentaries about them, at the end of the day, I say to myself, what is their eternal position? That's, that's always a challenge for me. That's a challenge for me. I, 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 I could liberate people from physical slavery, but what have I done in terms of my own life for my spiritual slavery that I would be in.
I think about these things. I think about myself. His point here, Jesus' point here, is simply that the actual enslavement of those believing Jews was not to Rome, but to sin, and therefore ultimately to death. Rome wasn't their master. Sin was their master. The one whose lifestyle is characterized by repeated, continuous sin is a slave to sin. And to break free from this bondage requires intervention, divine intervention. The Son must set us free. And he does so by means of his word. He does so by means of his word. As I have stated in previous lessons, a person is truly free when the word of God has replaced sin as the dominating and controlling passion and principle of his or her life. That's when we are truly free. A person is truly free then, not when he or she can do whatever he or she desires to do. That's easy. That's easy. But when he or she desires to do and has the power to do whatever scripture commands. In verse 35, our Lord's thought progresses from the idea of slavery to the status of slaves. He says the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. There are a couple of ways of looking at that and we'll explore them. The context is that the Jews believed that they were free because they were the physical descendants of Abraham. But the truth was that they were slaves to sin. In this verse, Jesus illustrates their sad predicament by describing the status of slaves as temporary and not permanent. He doesn't speak about the evils of being subject to slavery. He just speaks about one state being temporary and one state being permanent. Commenting on this verse, C.H. Spurgeon says, and I quote, a servant may be dismissed from the household, but a son may not. If we were only servants of God, we might fall from grace and perish. But if we are the sons of God, we never shall. If we ever did in truth call God Father, we shall always be able to use that blessed title. For the relationship of fatherhood is not a temporary one and cannot come to an end. End of quote. Remember, brothers and sisters, that Ishmael, Abraham's son, his first son, his first child, Ishmael was the son of a slave woman. And he was eventually cast out of the house because he was a son of the flesh for a time. For a time. Ishmael, Ishmael was treated like a prince. And Ishmael may have thought, I am going to be the inheritor of all things. But he was the son of the flesh. Isaac, Isaac was the son of a free woman. The son of promise. He, therefore, remained in the house. 
Paul emphasizes this in Galatians chapter 4, 21 and 31. I'm going to read it for us. He says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you listen to the law? In other words, have you ever even read the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, that's Hagar, and one by a free woman, Sarah. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So Ishmael was born according to the flesh. Ishmael is the product of a scheme concocted primarily by Sarah and agreed upon by Abraham that he would go into Hagar, Sarah's slave, and get her pregnant. And the child that was born as a result of this our relationship would become the heir because what God had promised didn't seem to be working out. So maybe as perhaps the most unscriptural scripture teaches, God helps those who help themselves. So let us help God out. Let us help ourselves and God will bless us. Is that far-fetched, brothers and sisters? Have you ever gone out and done something like that? Fixed up something and then prayed and asked God to bless it? Huh? You wouldn't want me to go down the line to deal with that, would you? And I wouldn't want to either. But you, you, you can understand me, huh? Huh? So, so I could, I, I, so, so let's say, let's say I am a single, single man in the church and no ladies in the church seem to want me. And sometimes the Jamaican Proverb is true, wanty, wanty, can't get it, and get it, get it, no wanty. But I say, you know, there's a very attractive young lady who works at my office, and she's so nice and classy. And she has good principles too. And a uh, voice in my ear says, is she saved? No, but she behaved better than many saved people. But there's another Jamaican proverb. You know where I'm going? See me and come live with me. I have told you of the, of the I'm coming back to that story, but I've told you of the of the lady who, this is true, she actually came up to a pastor, her pastor, after he had taught Bible study and said, Pastor, I wish my husband could be more like you. You're so understanding. You care so much. You're so kind. You speak so softly. And the pastor said to her, Sis, you want to know about me? You see, that lady sitting down there, ask her about me. You see me on Sunday and one day in the week. Talk to her, and I guarantee you, when you finish talking to her, you're going to want to stay with your little husband right there. Back to the story. So I, I say, let me do a thing. And, and God, who to tell God might save him eventually. Oh, 
All right, we're not going to ask for a show of hands. You get the picture though, brothers and sisters. And, and he, all of us are tempted in one way or another to fix up something and bring to God. It might not be a husband or a wife, but something. And then ask God to bless it. But when, when you and I walk according to the word, we don't have to ask God to bless anything, you know. Because it is already blessed. Okay, where were we? Verse 23, but, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. I just want to take a little time with this. In Genesis 18, 14, the Lord said to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a child. I am going to be the one who gives you the power to have a child. Because you dead and Sarah deader. You see, Ishmael was born when Abraham was still alive. So God says, it, you, 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 can't, you cannot have a child. Right? You know why? Because that which you should get up and go has got up and gone. One is, one is the flesh and one is promise. It's a serious thing, you know, brethren. Because look at me. This is promise. This is promise. And, and, and many times what we have achieved is not the blessing of God but the product of the flesh. And it's going to crumble before us one day, you know. You don't believe me. All right. Here's what Paul says. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai. One is from Mount Sinai, where the law was given, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. That's what your rule keeping is doing for you. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. I told you about present Jerusalem. But the Jerusalem above is free. And she is our mother. So we are talking about those born in the church. Born because of regeneration. A divine intervention that they have nothing to do with. That they contributed nothing to. For it is written, rejoice, O barren one, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him, who was, who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. You check out where persecution comes from most in the church, from ecclesiastical circles, and from what kind of church people. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Don't get that wrong. Ishmael inherited a lot of Abraham's wealth.
But that's where his blessings end. He's still a slave to sin. So, brothers and sisters, we are children of the slave. We are not children of the slave, sorry, but of the free woman. So, what Jesus was saying in effect to these Jews, he was asking them, are you like Ishmael, who was merely the physical descendant of Abraham and was eventually cast out of the house? Or are you like Isaac, the spirit? Spiritual descendant of Abraham who remained in the house and became the heir. Abraham had many sons. He had some who were his sons physically and one who was his son both physically and spiritually. And today he has many sons. There are many who can trace their lineage back and back and back and probably ended up with Abraham. They are his physical descendants, but they are in slavery. And there are many who have no physical attachment to Abraham, but they are his sons, his children spiritually. And Jesus is asking the Jews, are you just physical descendants of Abraham? Are you just in church because your mama did there? You save? That's the question. Ah, uh, In Luke 15, we are told about the prodigal son. You know why Jesus told that story? The prodigal son. He, told, he, he was actually saying, it, it all started because the Bible says that as he was in a certain place, a multitude of publicans and sinners gathered around him. And the religious leaders murmured against it. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you, you. I'm going to tell you a parable that shows you, you. The older brother is you. You have never left the house, but you have never been saved. You are a son. You are a son. Because the father came out and pleaded with you to come in and called you son. But you are just a son physically. You see, the persons who you despise, they are my children. They are sons spiritually. They are the ones who are covered with the robe. See, I called for my robe, the best robe, and covered him. You don't get that. Because you have never done anything wrong. And my grace is for those who have done everything wrong. So you can be in the house all your life and still not be saved. Verse 16. You think the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you think that rich man was a pagan? You think he was a Gentile? He was a Jew. He was a Jew. In hell, when he lifted up his eyes, what did he say? Father Abraham. No Gentile would say that. And Abraham said, son, physically, but the one who was at your gate begging. And, and, and folks, hear me. Let's not sentimentalize the passage. Lazarus was not caught up and taken into Abraham's bosom because he was poor and he was suffering. Somewhere in his suffering, he established a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't worry, think that God took pity on and just said, since you're poor, come up. No. And he said to the rich man, since you rich, hell you're going to go. Hey, don't work that way. 
We, we must not do that to scripture. Brethren, don't, let us not bring our carnal thoughts to scripture, our worldly thoughts that we get from the philosophers of the day. Don't bring that to scripture. This man, wasn't, this man didn't find himself in Abraham's bosom because he was poor. He found himself in Abraham's bosom because he was saved. And, 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 and here is one man calling on Father Abraham. Calling on Father Abraham in hell. The, I just need to look at my life and see which, which one of the sons am I. A son, as the slave, does not remain in the house forever. Our Lord may be intimating by this statement that the person whose lifestyle is characterized by repeated continuous sin will eventually leave the fellowship of those who are abiding or continuing in the word of Christ because they really are not a part of the family of God. Son, the slave doesn't remain forever. It is only those who receive Jesus Christ as the Son of God, whether they are natural descendants of Abraham or not, those are the ones who are truly the sons of God, and the true sons of God will abide or continue in Jesus' word. Is this not what we are told in 1 John 18 to 24? John says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. So there were antichrists around in the day of John. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Now he moves from they to you, but you, in contradistinction to them, have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. This anointing is not a feeling, brethren. It's not a warm feeling. This is speaking about the Holy Spirit who indwells believers. He's talking about the oil of anointing, which when it was poured on a person's head, symbolically represented the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about this. Get that out of your mind. I'm sorry, but I have to tell you the truth. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. who has who, He who denies the Father and the Son. If I were to deal with that, it's going to get me into a lot of trouble because it's... A lot of implications on that. He who denies the Father and the Son. That's not our burden today. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abide, abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. In John 8, 35, where Jesus says, he, 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 
I, I leave that alone. J J Jesus speaks of himself not merely as a son. Not merely as a son, but as the son. You see that? You see that? He doesn't say the slave. Maybe kicked out of the house. But a son abides forever. He says, the son abides forever. What is he talking about? We get a little clue in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling. He's writing to the Hebrews, you know. But he, he, he makes a distinction. He says, I'm, I'm talking now to those who share in a heavenly calling. I'm talking to those who are truly saved among you. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. That sounds like Jesus and Moses are on the same level, eh? For, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Why does the builder of a, of a house have more honor than the house itself? Because the house never built itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his hope if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Moses was faithful in, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. Jesus Christ is, not was, is faithful over, not in God's house, but over God's house, not as a servant, but as a son. Moses was only a part of God's household of faith. He was a faithful servant in the household, whereas Jesus is the creator of that household. He's therefore equal to God and greater than Moses. Moses is honored by, by being called the servant of God, but Jesus is the son of God. And as a son, he's master over the house. It is because Jesus is the son over God's house that he's able to give to those who sincerely believe in him the freedom of which he speaks. Freedom from the tyranny of sin. That Brethren, listen. Christianity is not about a creed. Christianity is not about following a person's example. Christianity is more than that. Christianity is the only religion in the world, the only one, in which you don't do anything in order to be saved. Everything has been done for you. The only one. I, I don't have to fight with anybody about what I believe. I know Christianity is unique. Every one of the other religions say, follow the example of our teacher. Jesus says, you have to do more than that with me. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have to absorb me into you. The Muslims don't talk about Muhammad dwelling in them. 
Buddhists don't talk about Buddha dwelling in them. Christianity says you cannot be saved unless Christ is in you and you have to be in him. That's a spiritual transaction. You can't live good enough for that to happen to you. That has to happen to you and then you start living good. And you start living good because that has happened to you. The sun has to set us free. That is why Jesus says in verse 36, if the sun sets you free, you will be free, free indeed because the sun is master of the house. And if he wants, he can go to any slave he wishes and say to him, you are free. If the Lord God is of the same mind as I am, we will consider this verse in detail next week. But I want to conclude by reading Psalm 119, verses 25 to 32. I've been saying to us, brothers and sisters, that the only way to experience a genuine spiritual revival is to The only way to have genuine spiritual revival is to read Bible. You have revival through read Bible. There's no other way to achieve it. Psalm 119, 25 to 32. Thank you, media team for highlighting those little things. Thank you. Here's what the psalmist says. I collapse in the dirt. How am I going to be revived? How am I going to get up from the dirt? Revive me. How? With your word. Revive me with your word. Revive me with your word. I have never, ever had a revival in my life that did not come through the word. The psalmist says, I told you about my ways. When last have you told God about your ways? I told God, I told you about my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Help me to understand what your precepts mean. Is that what you do when you come to a difficult passage that you, ha you find hard to understand? Do you pray that prayer? Help me to understand what your precepts mean. Then... I can meditate on your marvelous teachings. I collapse from grief. Sustain me by your word. Remove me from the path of deceit. How are all these things to be done? Remove me from the path of deceit. Graciously give me your law. I choose the path of faithfulness. I choose the path of faithfulness. I am committed to your regulations. That's the path of, you do have no path of faithfulness outside of a committal. When I say I choose to serve God, what am I saying? Me choose to come and jump up and down. On a Sunday? No. I choose to live my life based on what you say. I choose the path of faithfulness. How can that be proven, John? I am committed to your regulations. I hold fast to your rules, O oh Lord. Do not let me be ashamed. I run along the path of your commands. How are you able to do that? 
for you enable me to do so. So, 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 I want to pray, Lord. I want to run along the path of your commands, but the only way I can do it is if you enable me to do so. Let's stand. Next, next week, Lord willing, we're going to, to, to end our look at John chapter 8 by just looking at Jesus' statement, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you will be free. And not, not just free, but what does he mean free indeed? Or really, truly free? But brothers and sisters, I am a firm believer that as a pastor, you get what you preach. And whatever is your mission is going to dictate to your ministry. If your mission, if your motivation is to be well liked by people, you're going to preach a socially acceptable gospel. You're going to make it easy for people to serve God. If you, and, and, and if, you, if, if, if your mission or your motivation is to have a mega church, you're going to be worse. But if, if your mission and your motivation is to present everybody perfect before Jesus Christ, your ministry is going to be different. Because you're going to have to, you, you, you first are going to have to, to digest the hard things and deal with them and realize that you are just as corrupt as the people that you're preaching to. And if it don't preach it to them, if you don't preach it to yourself. And there is and and, and, and constantly, brethren, I have to ask myself, what kind of church do I want? And and and, and the answer to that question is another question. What kind of church does Jesus want? That's not, that's not too difficult to answer. He wants a church of people that look like him, that operate like him. And so, I am finding now that when I have challenges when I have challenges something is saying to me go to the word but I've already done my daily bible go to the word just go to the word saturate your mind with the word before you say or do anything foolish before you before you before you heard this that it was said about you before you call the person who you hear say it about you go to the word Saturate your mind with the word. There's a perspective that you don't understand. Take, take your, take your, drag your mind away from some of the people that you've been listening to. T -t recapture your mind from your teachers. And come back to the teacher. Train your, disciple your mind by the Bible. What does scripture say? 
we, I, I, I can't, I can't, my defense can't be, I'm just a human being. And I can't, that's not my defense. So brothers and sisters, let us today, if we have heard the Lord's voice, let's not harden our hearts. And I know some persons have heard the voice of the Lord above my voice. I know that. And I'm asking us, those who have heard his voice, to respond by making a deep commitment to continue, to either to continue to persevere in his word or to rediscover his word as the controlling passion and principle of our lives. Our singers are coming and then we'll pray and receive the offering and then we go home. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Oh, so long I've searched for life's meaning and slaved by the world and my greed. Then the door of my prison was opened by love for the ransom was paid I am free oh I'm free from the 
we pray, before we pray, and there may be somebody here today who is hearing the gospel for the first time. And you want that freedom that the gospel both offers and grants. When, when the children of Israel were in Egypt and God spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Passover lamb, he gave them instruction. And he said to them, the angel of destruction, the devouring angel, is going to pass through the land. And he's going to kill all the firstborn of the land. And he says, you are no better than the Egyptians. There is not one iota of difference between you and the Egyptians except that I have adopted you. And I am intervening and telling you that you have to kill a lamb. The blood has to be shed, but you have to eat it and you can't leave any of it until the following morning. What you don't eat, you have to throw away. You know what he said to them in another chapter? He said, don't go outside. Because if you go outside, the devouring angel is going to kill you because you're you deserve to die, just like the Egyptians. The only thing that makes a difference is the mark of the blood. The, 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 Christianity is the only religion that has a lamb. How is God going to defeat the devourer by something more mighty? No by the weakest of all animals, the most simple and helpless of all animals, a lamb. No other religion preaches that. It can't. They can't because they are not inspired. They can't. Always a more powerful symbol. Lamb. Realize, brothers and sisters, that none of us in here have any reason to boast about anything we are here today because God has adopted us we deserve to die we are as hell deserving as the most wicked sinner that lives but God that's the story of our lives but God who is rich in glory Let's stand as we pray. Oh God. <laughs> Help us. Help me. Lord, we are coming to you as your people come to you. Lord God, we read today in our Bible reading that it is possible for people to come even to your prophet and make inquiries, but they have set up idols in their hearts and they have already embraced stumbling blocks that are going to cause them to go astray. We are not coming like that, Lord. We are not coming like that. We are coming 
as those who are weak and broken. We know that we are sinners. The evidence of our sinfulness is palpable. But we also know, those of us who are saved, that we are clothed in the righteousness of your Son. And so we come today, Lord, because we have a desire to embrace everything that you embrace. We have a desire to be discipled by your word. We have a desire, Lord, that when we are wounded by your word, when your word comes against everything that we desire, we have a desire now, Lord, to say, God Almighty, deliver me from my carnality. Help me not to be in opposition to your word. Help me to bow before the sovereignty of your word. Help me to be like Peter and the other disciples who when many were offended by your statement Peter said Lord we don't understand what you mean either but it's not that we don't have anywhere else to go it's that we don't have anyone else to go to. To whom else shall we go? Our friends were following a what, but we are following a who. I'm captured by your holy calling. In the midst of my rebellion, I know it. I'm captured by your holy calling. So we ask you, Lord, to set us apart and draw us to yourself and lead us, Lord, we pray. Whatever you have to do, Lord, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, your Son, we ask you to do it. Help us, Lord, to develop the capacity to judge ourselves so that you will not have to judge us. Open our eyes, Lord, so that we can see where we are going astray and come to you for the remedy. We do not want you, Lord, to have to impose a remedy from the outside. For if we judge ourselves, your word says, we would not be judged. Give us that capacity, Lord. Give us that capacity. As a church, Lord, we want to be recognized by our faithfulness to scripture our faithfulness to scripture continue your work in our lives Lord and we commit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus Christ if, if you are here today and you are hearing the gospel for the first time or if you, if you, if God has spoken to you today concerning the way you are living, 
I'd like for you to come and talk to me after the end of the service. Maybe just for five minutes. Just for five minutes. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Roshina is coming to uh, give us the announcements and then we'll receive the offering. Then we'll greet each other and separate one from the other. Thank you, singers. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just want to extend welcome to Brother Clinton Webster, who is also visiting from New York and came in after the official welcome. Are you here, Sir Webster? All right, he's with, give him a round of applause. Thank you for joining us today. All right, do we have our phones with us? Reach for your phones quickly, quickly. Reach for your phones. You don't have... Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, and by this, you should be at your dial pad. Ready? Star, one, two, one. You're at the dial pad? Don't worry about which network. Star, one, two, one. All right, and then you're going to slowly now go back to your clock application. Yes, your clock application. And you're going to set your clock for 6.55 p.m. Sunday, March 10th. And what will be happening? We will be having Grow in Grace. And anybody remember? <laughs> So your clock will buzz at 6.55, reminding you for Growing Grace at 7 p.m. And we are on the topic of the Holy Spirit and the believer. Please join us on Google Meet. Thursday, March 14, we have Bible study at the Scouts headquarters, 6.30 p.m. for prayer and 7 p.m. for Bible studies. Sunday, March 17, at 8 a.m., it's Focus Per, and at 9 a.m., we have in-person worship service right here at the Micah Gymnasium. And 7 p.m. again on March 17, we have Grow in Grace via Google Meet. Our Bible reading, we continue on the same theme, Jesus, the great subject of Scripture, and today we are at 2 Samuel 14, verses 25 to 33. Now for our general notices, Tuesday, March 12th, there will be a prayer meeting at the residence of the mother of Sister Charlena Drummond at Botany Bay District, St. Thomas, just before you get to White Horses. For directions, please call 876 313-5464. That's 876-313-5464. There will be a prayer meeting and fellowship in honor of Isilda Johnson, the mother of Marlene Thorpe, at Swallowfield Chapel, 5 Swallowfield Road, Kingston 5, starting at 6 p.m. On Thursday, March 14th, Thanksgiving service for the mother of Sister Charlena Drummond will be held at Grace Chapel UPC Yalas, South Haven, St. Thomas at 10 a.m. Thanksgiving service for Isilda Johnson, the mother of Sister Marlene Thorpe, will be held at Swallowfield Chapel, 5 Swallowfield Road, Kingston 5, at 11.30 a.m. So both services are on March 14th, that is. Please be reminded of our upcoming fasting, which will be March 25th through to 28th. You will get further details via our media page as we move closer to that. For our birthdays and anniversary acknowledgement, we want to celebrate all those who are celebrating birthday today. Is anyone here? 
Celebrating a birthday today? All the celebrators for this week, are you in the house? Just jump up if you hear your name. Maria Smith Rose, March 10 to 16. Elsa McIntosh, if you're here, jump up. Marjiana Richards. Jennifer Brown. Madge Brown. Josephine Dehaney. Madeline McIntosh. Come on, man, just jump and give us a wave. Michael Allen. Dave Green. Natoya White. And that's it. We want to wish you a happy, happy birthday when it comes. Do we have any anniversary celebrators here? Anyone celebrating an anniversary this week? Yesterday, come on, jump to, jump to your feet, you're here. You see, I like when they're so happy and they don't mind us acknowledging them. So give wifey a nice little chops. A nice little chops. Give wifey a nice little chops. Give wifey. Give wifey a night. Hey, beautiful. Happy, happy anniversary to you. And we wish for you many more years. Awesome. And we're now at the ministry of giving. Praise the Lord, somebody. Praise the Lord. As always, you can turn your attention to the screen. You'll be reminded of the current ways you can give. Let me take this opportunity to thank you for your continuous generosity in giving towards this ministry. It aids in our effectiveness in serving. And so we are most grateful. Praise the Lord. As we prepare to bless our offering, I just want to remind you as well that there are still some available copies of the two lawyers and the doctor available on sale today so you can get your copy before you leave. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you there, Lord, for being such a gracious God to us, a Lord that is always given regardless of our circumstances. Lord, we thank you for being our provider. We thank you for being our God. Lord, as we are about to give our offering, I pray, dear Lord, that you will bless us Cause us to be happy givers more than we are receivers. I pray, dear God, that you will bless this offering as it is given. And I pray that you will even multiply it, dear God, to do the work of the ministry and to reach as many souls, lives as possible. Lord, we just want to say thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Hallelujah, as we are getting ready to give, let us worship the Lord in giving for his provision for us over the last couple of weeks, all right? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 